Hello. In this video, we are going to talk about thermal considerations that we need to keep in mind when we are designing using power devices uh, or power circuits in general. We've already seen that power transistors can dissipate large amounts of power, and this power dissipation produces a rise in the internal temperature of the device, specifically the collector junction temperature. Uh, there is a maximum junction temperature that a transistor can withstand before it, um, it suffers permanent damage. And that's typically listed in the apps max table in the data sheet. It's referred to as uh, TJ max or maximum junction temperature. And for a VJT transistor, it tends to be in the range of 150 to 200 degrees C. Now the heat that is produced at the junction, uh, which is sitting at the temperature uh, T sub J for junction temperature, passes through the transistor case, which is sitting at the temperature referred to as T sub C for case temperature, and it radiates into the surrounding air. The surrounding air being sitting at what we know uh, or we refer to as the ambient temperature T sub A. You will see that for most data sheets, the nominal ambient temperature is assumed to be 25 degrees C. And that's often the, the testing conditions for a lot of these devices. The uh, thermal conduction process uh, that takes place as the heat um, goes from the junction and it gets eventually dissipated into the air, giving rise to these temperature differentials along the way, uh, can be um, modeled using an electrical equivalent process, which I have tried to represent here. So we have the power dissipation, um, which can be modeled as a current. and uh, as that uh, power dissipation goes through um, different thermal resistances, which are labeled there as theta, uh, it produces differences in temperature, which will be in our model the equivalent of the voltage. So we can see, uh, as far as these circuits goes, in terms of the electrical equivalent, we will have a current flowing through three resistances giving rise to uh, voltage drops or voltage differences along the different nodes within that resistor network. In this case, we have um, our power dissipation be the current, as we mentioned, and then we have three different resistances. Those are modeling the thermal resistances, um, thermal resistance from junction to case, theta JC, from case to sink, if you have a heat sink, uh, theta CS, and from sink to ambient, um, theta SA. And we can write um, an expression modeling Ohm's law, which will say uh, difference in voltage across a resistor is equal to the current through the resistor times the resistance. We can say that the difference in temperature across all those thermal resistances is equal to uh, the power dissipation times the equivalent thermal resistance, which in this case is the sun, because they're connected in series. And as we mentioned, we not always have a heat sink. Uh, if we don't have a heat sink and our case um, is directly connected through a thermal resistance to the ambient temperature or to the ambient, we will just simply use a theta case to ambient. And uh, normally these thermal resistance values also come specified in the data sheet, or we are given some plots uh, from where we can derive these thermal resistance values. Uh, normally the heat sink is not included for a data sheet of a transistor, but if you are adding a heat sink to your circuit to try to dissipate that heat more efficiently, then you'll need to keep it into consideration. Um, uh, we can also write our uh, maximum power dissipation for the device based on that equation as uh, the maximum junction temperature minus the ambient temperature divided by the overall thermal resistance. As we mentioned earlier, thermal resistances can be specified in the data sheet oftentimes, and when they do, we can see from the second equation, uh, they're going to have units of uh, temperature divided by power or degree C per watt. And the thermal resistance essentially uh, represents how easily the heat is transferred from uh, one place to another. So the thermal resistance from the junction to the case will represent uh, how easily the heat can move from the junction to the case of the device. 
As we mentioned, data sheets often specify the maximum power dissipation for a particular value of the ambient temperature. Uh, and the nominal value of the ambient temperature is typically uh, specified as Ta equals 25 degrees C. The reason for that is that that's the nominal room temperature. And so as long as uh, our transistor is operating in an environment where the temperature is less than or equal to 25 degrees C, uh, we are safe assuming that that's the maximum power dissipation. But what happens, for example, if our transistor or our device is intended to operate uh, in an environment where the ambient temperature is greater than the nominal 25 degrees C? Let's imagine, for example, that uh, our device is meant to be part of a circuit that is within an enclosure, and so we expect that the temperature within that enclosure is going to be uh, greater than 25 degrees C. In that case, we need to derate our transistor. And uh, the process of power derating consists of uh, reducing the maximum operating power as the temperature increases. Uh, normally, data sheets indicate they have either a power derating factor that they will tell you. They will tell you so as long as the temperature is um, up to 25 degrees C for ambient temperature, then this is the maximum power dissipation. And then if the ambient temperature increases beyond that, you are to derate the transistor at the rate of, I don't know, uh, 5 milliwatts per degree C, meaning for every degree C that the temperature increases, you need to reduce your maximum power dissipation by 2 milliwatts. Or oftentimes, instead of specifying the power derating factor, they'll just give you a power derating curve, uh, which is essentially what I've represented here, is a, a graphical representation of the maximum power dissipation versus the ambient temperature. Uh, and you will notice that the maximum power dissipation will be a constant, a nominal constant, up to the nominal ambient temperature. And then as the temperature keeps increasing beyond that, the power dissipation, maximum power dissipation allowed for the transistor, also known as the power rating of the transistor, uh, starts to decrease as temperature increases. It's normally a linear decrease. That uh, power derating factor, which is also the slope of that curve, uh, it can also be uh, computed or calculated as the inverse of the thermal resistance from junction to ambient. And so if the data sheet specifies the thermal resistance, then you should also be able to calculate your power derating factor from there. Um, if you want to see an example of a power derating curve for a power transistor, you can take a look at the data sheet for the 2N. Uh, 3055. Uh, transistors also um, often specify or provide within the data sheet a plot of the safe operating area. Uh, needless to say, power devices are slightly different from their small signal counterparts, um, not just in their characteristics, but also a little bit in the way that they are designed uh, and in the way they operate. And, uh, but for every transistor, there's typically uh, a safe operating area. There's going to be a maximum collector current that they can withstand, which is represented here uh, with little uh, circled one. That will be the value of the maximum collector current from the data sheet. And if we are to be within the safe operating area of that transistor, we are not to exceed that maximum value of collector current. Um, likewise, number four here uh, represents uh, VBR, the, the collector breakdown voltage, and so we are not to exceed the um, collector, collector to emitter breakdown voltage um, VBR I've listed here. And again, for a power transistor, it's going to be higher than for a small signal transistor, but in any case, uh, you're not to exceed what comes specified in the data sheet as the absolute ma maximum value for that voltage before the transistor goes into breakdown. Um, but then there is a, an, an area where you can safely operate a transistor, and it's not just delimited by those two straight lines, maximum current and maximum VCE voltage, but rather uh, there are other things that come into play. And if you look at the curve, you will see that there is a little hyperbola following uh, number one there, labeled number two. And the reason why uh, the maximum amount of current, a collector current decreases as the VCE voltage increases is because um, you want to be within your 
uh, power dissipation limits within your maximum power dissipation. And so you want to keep your transistor within the power rating. And so you want to stay below that hyperbola. Um, and then there is uh, another sort of hyperbola that happens, which is labeled number three there. Uh, and that's a process known as the second breakdown. And it basically stems from the fact that the, uh, the flow of current is not um, uniform across the, the PN junction, uh, but rather the current is slightly, the value of the current is slightly larger, closer to the junction, and so that creates hot spots and uh, can produce thermal runaway and so forth. And so you also want to stay below the line specified in the uh, safe operating area curve, also sometimes referred to as the SOA. Um, and that second hyperbola will um, specify that second breakdown region. Now, when you look at an SOA curve in a data sheet, typically it is plotted in a semi-log scale. And so what you will see is uh, the representation in the bottom there, where I have um, uh, represented the hyperbolas of number two and number three as straight lines, because that's what they will essentially be looking like in a semi-log plot, where the um, x-axis is now in a logarithmic scale. Uh, but again, the regions are the same, and uh, that safe operating area is provided for the circuit designer to ensure uh, that the transistor is always being operated according to um, collector current values and collector emitter voltage values that uh, fall within that safe operating area. If you want to take a look at an example uh, SOA curve, you can look at the data sheet for the 2N5190G which is another power transistor. Now, in order to uh, dissipate heat more efficiently, uh, it is possible to use either a special package for your transistor, a package that will dissipate the heat more efficiently, or a heat sink, or both. Um, a heat sink will be something that you typically place on top of uh, the package of a transistor or that you attach somehow to the packaging of a transistor. And again, the idea is that it provides a large surface area um, which uh, allows for efficient heat dissipation. Uh, so I've represented a couple of uh, examples of special packages and heat sinks below. Uh, the first one listed there is the TO3 package, which is used, for example, in transistor uh, 2N3055. It's a power transistor. And notice that it typically has uh, only two terminals. I've drawn two pins there. And so if that's an individual transistor, one of those pins will be the emitter, the other pin will be the base, and the collector is typically attached to the casing of the transistor. And so, um, collector terminal. Attached to case. And the idea is that if you have a metal case, um, it, and it's connected directly to the collector, it will provide all this surface area uh, that will allow for efficient heat dissipation, thus um, lowering the junction temperature for the transistor. Another example uh, is the TO220 package, or there are others that are similar, like the TO225 package and so forth. Uh, they all have a similar way of operating. You can see here this will be a transistor, um, let's imagine the 2N6107 as an example. And uh, each one of these terminals will correspond to a terminal within the transistor, so uh, base, collector, emitter. But then the collector terminal will also be uh, attached internally to a metal tab. See, which again, it allows for efficient heat dissipation. And oftentimes, that metal tab uh, is also attached to uh, a little metal pad that is on the board. The, the pins are designed so that when you connect the three pins on your board, they are like through-hole type of connection, then you can bend the part over so that the metal tab can touch uh, like a small metal plane on your board, which will allow for uh, even more efficient heat dissipation. So some, those are some of the techniques. Uh, used with a special package or a combination of special package and uh, heat sink. And then the final one is just simply using a heat sink, and, uh, which you could attach, let's imagine, to uh, the TO3 device that I've represented there in the first drawing. You could connect a heat sink to it if you needed to expand 
uh, the amount of surface area in order to provide more efficient heat dissipation. And there are different models for heat sinks, but they all tend to have this thing in common that you know they tend to fan out um, as much as possible to try to have as much surface area exposed to the air as possible in um, in a small uh, volume. Now, the idea be behind heat sinks or the advantage of using a heat sink or a special package is that uh, it essentially increases the maximum operating temperature for um, uh, the maximum operating power, excuse me, for a given ambient temperature. And the reason for that is because they provide very good thermal resistance and therefore very good heat dissipation. Um, and therefore, for a given ambient temperature, they allow for uh, the junction temperature to stay at, to remain at a lower value for a given value of power dissipation.